Hello everybody, my name is Peter Klapper from the School of Biosciences at the University of Kent in Canterbury and in this video clip I would like to take you on a little journey about the history of the atom. Now why do we want to learn about atom and how it was discovered? Well, simply because life universe and everything else is based on atoms. So atoms are the foundation of what we see, what we feel, what we smell. L atoms are everywhere and that is why we need to understand what is an atom and I think it's also very interesting to see how it was discovered. Now let's have a look. It all started about uh, two and a half thousand years ago uh, with a Greek philosopher called uh, Democritus. He's also very often uh, called the father of modern science, although at his time he was just one of many philosophers who um, concerned themselves with understanding what is reality, what is there, how are we built, what is life, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, he came up with a really brilliant experiment. It was just simply a thought experiment, if you like. He didn't have the means to do it, actually. But he and his students uh, thought about uh, the, this experiment quite a long time. And the experiment is pretty simple in terms of uh, thought experiments. So let's assume we uh, just simply have a bar of gold like this one here. It's quite nice. Bar of gold and we take a very sharp knife and we then just cut this bar in two, in half. Well that's not a half. Let me do it properly. So that would be a half. Okay, we cut this in half. So we will get two halves. Two parts of this gold bar of similar size. Okay, now in the next step we take one of these bars and again cut it into a half. So we now have a quarter of the original uh, gold bar. Now we take this quarter and we cut it again into a half. Now we've got an eighth of this bar. And we can do that several times. Now Democritus asked, can you divide this gold bar infinitely often? Can you cut and cut and cut? Okay, at one point you come to a point where you can't see the, the, the part of gold that you've just divided. But okay, let's take a microscope, let's take a sharper knife, and we can cut it again, and again, and again maybe. So will we ever come to an end, or will we be able to cut that ad infinitum, forever? in all eternity. So what do you think? Can you A, divide it infinitively often or B, divide it only a certain amount of time until you reach a point where you simply cannot divide it anymore? Just think about it for a minute. Now, have you come up with, a, with an answer? It's not that easy. But Democritus and his students said there is probably a point where we can't divide this gold bar any further. It is no longer dividable. And this undividable in Greek is called atomos. It simply means we cannot divide it any further. Now, what does this atomos, this undividable thing, look like? Well, of course, Democritus didn't know. 
he didn't have any way of investigating that further and it took a long time until we developed the right tools to investigate this further. So it took almost 2000 years then to come up with the tools to investigate what this atomos or this atom, this putative thing might look like. And it was in the between 1850 and 1950, this was a century of enormous discoveries. So, for example, photography was developed and invented and the tools that photography uses uh, were absolutely essential for the analysis of what an atom is. Electricity and electromagnetic properties were discovered. Uh, Gustav Röntgen found X-rays and a young Polish lady called Madame Curie discovered radioactivity in France. And these were all extremely important discoveries at that time that led us to an understanding of what is an atom. Now this guy here, Joseph G. Tom Thompson, uh, worked in Cambridge in the UK and uh, he did some really clever experiments on electricity and on some materials and he found out actually that matter as we know it is composed of some negatively charged things so here they are negatively charged minus and they also uh, contain positively charged things so these negatively charged things that Thomson discovered, he called them electrons, and he taught us that these electrons surround something that is positively charged. And he called this a nucleus. So these negatively charged electrons whiz around this positively charged nucleus. But how they do that, at that point, we didn't know. But this was already a very important step in our understanding of what an atom looks like. Now, this looks almost a little bit like uh, an apple. An apple has its core here and it is then surrounded by the, the flesh that we eat and in Thompson's uh, thought it was basically you have a positive core and then you have this flesh of electrons that are somehow forming a sort of uh, um, well almost the skin and the, and the flesh of this uh, atom. And the atom itself uh, had about this size. Of course, atoms, and everybody agreed on that, atoms had to be very, very small because they are so small that they can't divide, be divided a anymore. So that was uh, Joseph Thompson's concept. He had a very clever student from New Zealand uh, called Ernest Rutherford and he decided that he wanted to look at the structure of this atom. What does it look like, this atom? Is it really this apple core and then this flesh of electrons around it? So he designed a few very, very interesting experiments, very clever experiments. He took a gold foil and bombarded it with some particles. And to his absolute horror and shock, he found that, well, the atom is almost empty. It was really shocking discovery. It is as almost if you have an apple, there is a core and then there is nothing else out there. 
but it still has the shape of an apple. So how does that work? Well, just to show you uh, uh, an analogy, here is my favorite football stadium. It's the Allianz Arena in Munich in Germany, uh, which is a home to my favorite football club, uh, FC Bayern Munich. And if we just imagine for a moment that we can inflate an atom to the size of this football stadium, which has a capacity of 70,000 seats, this is now the size of our atom. And now we take one tiny little garden pea and we place this tiny little garden pea in the middle of the stadium. This tiny little garden pea here, which you can't even see, that is the positive nucleus. And the enormous size of this football stadium now, that is the atom. This is where the electrons are moving around in the stadium. And this tiny little P in the middle circle, that is the nucleus. That's where all the matter sits. So what is, what is this empty space? Well, it is exactly what it says. It is empty space. There is nothing in there. And it took a, a long time to really understand that, that there is nothing. Basically, if we are talking about atoms, we are talking about nothing. We, all the matter that we see and touch, is really, literally, nothing. There's a tiny little positive thing in the center of a vast amount of space. Now, Rutherford, together with uh, another guy uh, called Niels Bohr, they came up with this sort of model that they discovered, and they said, okay, we have uh, a positive nucleus and then we have electrons that are whizzing around and they are sitting on certain orbits. It is a little bit like the, uh, like the solar system. So in the middle we have the positive nucleus or here the sun and the planets are a little bit like uh, the, the electrons and they surround this nucleus or the sun on very well defined orbits. They go round and round and round and in between the sun and the planets basically there is nothing. There's empty space and that is what is called the Rutherford Bohr model. And at that time, uh, it was uh, generally accepted. Now, this guy, Niels Bohr, refined this model from uh, several observations. So he, for example, said, OK, in the center, we have this positively charged nucleus and we have the electrons. So here we have electrons and I just abbreviate them like that and in the center we have the nucleus which is positively charged and these electrons are moving around on very well-defined orbits and uh, he also found out that on the inner orbit there can be only two of these planets or electrons on the next further out orbit there can be eight and then eight again on the next orbit and he came up with some rules we will discuss these rules in uh, another video but this was the the Bohr model which in a way made us understand how electrons and nucleus actually are made up and they also the, this model also explained certain properties of atoms 
Now, we now understand that these uh, electrons are actually not really like moving around on these shells, if you like, and very often they are still referred to as shells, on these uh, very simple spherical uh, areas around the nucleus, it is actually a little bit more difficult. We only understood that uh, when uh, people like Max Born, uh, Max Planck, uh, and uh, Schrödinger, Erwin Schrödinger, actually came up with some fairly complicated and mathematical descriptions how these orbitals actually work. And they found out they are three dimensional orbits. They are sort of these. Uh, almost cloud-like structures. And in these cloud-like structures, the electrons have a certain probability to, to hang out. So it's not just a two-dimensional uh, circle on which these electrons move around. They are moving around in these three dimensions. And these these orbitals actually can be quite complicated. So here is a, a sort of an overview. Here is the uh, the most basic orbital. Then the next orbital is sort of already uh, looks a little bit more complicated, and then it get it gets more and more complicated. The more electrons you have, the more complicated these orbitals become. But that is our current understanding: how these electrons actually move around this positive nucleus. Now, here was another uh, problem that concerned a lot of people. We have a positive nucleus, and this nucleus is extremely small. It's really tiny, and it has all the positive charges concentrated in a tiny space. Now, we know that uh, the same uh, uh, sign will repel each other. So uh, if you have a North Pole and a North Pole of a magnet, they will just simply fly apart. So why on earth doesn't a nucleus with all these positively charged uh, bits in it, why doesn't it fall apart? Well, uh, in 1940, uh, again, a very clever guy, James Chadwick, uh, came up with an idea and uh, he actually could show what's happening. He showed that most nuclei, that's the plural of nucleus, are actually made up of these positively charged protons. So they are positively charged and they make the electrons whiz around outside. But there is also sort of a glue that the protons don't repel each other. And these other particles are called neutrons. And as the name says, and you can probably figure out, they don't have a charge. They are neutral. So don't they, they don't have a charge. They are a glue so that the protons don't get in contact with each other and uh, the whole nucleus falls apart. So this is a quite an interesting concept because it tells us that the nucleus of an atom where we thought it's no longer dividable, that this nucleus, this atom, can actually be subdivided in smaller into smaller particles into subatomic particles and these subatomic particles are the protons and the neutrons Only in 1964, we even learned that these subatomic particles, so subatomic particles, 
can even be further subdivided. So these uh, neutrons and positrons can be further subdivided in a set of three further particles, and they have been called quarks uh, by this uh, extremely clever uh, man, uh, Murray Gell-Mann, and his colleague George Zweig. And they propose these, these very, very strange things. They are called quarks. Uh, and when uh, he was asked, how did you come up with this name for quark? He said, oh, I was at that time, I was reading James Joyce, Finnegan's Wake. And uh, this, this, this word quark came up in this poem. Uh, nobody knows what, what it actually means. Uh, not a lot of people can make a sense of James Joyce, uh, but he, he very much liked this word quark. And what it basically is, it is really the lowest level of particle. We cannot isolate uh, individual parks, quarks. And they are really strange things, but they are really the fundamental of all matter. So these quarks form protons and the neutrons. And protons and neutrons then form the atoms. Whether these quarks are in any way subdivided into something else, we don't know. Uh, so only the future will show whether there is another level, whether there is an even smaller level. We need to be very clear that the atoms are still extremely small and we can't see them properly. Uh, there are techniques available that uh, allow us to visualize atoms, uh, but it is very difficult. So I hope you enjoyed this video. What you should have uh, understood now is what is an atom and how is it made of, so we said it is protons and neutrons, and it's all surrounded by electrons, but these electrons are not like planets surrounding the sun, it is more sort of a cloud of electrons uh, that is surrounding these a uh, positively charged nuclei. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it.